Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Matt, how's it going? Great. How are you, Matt? I'm doing well. I'm glad we finally got to schedule this. Um, you are the primary author of a series of mon monographs under the banner of the realities of socialism. And I know that you've, I think you've co-authored several with my, my friend and Austrian economist, Peter Betke. Um, and and I, I love this project. I've now gotten through, through several, several of them because you guys have successfully integrated economics, history, culture, and, and also um, there's politics in there because you talk about the, the politics of transition from, from socialism to um, market economies, which, which is, is, a, is a thing I want to talk about. But uh, the, the, the thing that struck me most was the shocking polling. So I'm on realitiesofsocialism.org. And I've seen these polls before, but you guys have done a bunch of polling showing that I think it's 43% of, of Americans from 18 to 25 um, think that socialism is a better system than capitalism. How, how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, it, it is remarkable. It, it, when I started this project, one of the things that uh, was sort of rolling around my head is this timeline and my personal timeline. And I, and I uh, at some point I realized that... Um, you know, right now we are as far away from the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, as I was from Hitler's death when I was born. And, you know, it struck me that the previous generation had, uh, you know, done their darndest to make sure that people that were born when I was born knew were under no illusions about what um, fascism was like, Hitlerism was like, nas National Socialism was like. We were, uh, you know, raised on that awareness, and I worry that people raised today are just not raised in that same level of awareness about what um, the the other horror of the 20th century socialism was actually like. Yeah, it's um, these are things that, e but even and I, and I'm older than you, I suspect. I'm fairly certain that's true. Um, but um, we were certainly taught, you know, this old political spectrum. This, and I, I would call it a a myth of you know the hard left was was Stalin and Lenin and and Mao and and Pol Pot and and the hard right was was Hitler and Mussolini and and other fascists and and it never made sense but but we were mostly taught about the um, the the horrible inhumane genocides on on this far right spectrum um, I I didn't learn about about. Stalinist murderous uh, record in high school. Um, I did in college because I went to Grove City College, but that's that's a unicorn. It, most most kids today are not going to Grove City College, right? So it's um, yeah. so it's 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 always been a problem, and I think I think it's it's probably the the romance in academia that you know for all of the the murderous track records of socialism in practice. You know, they just didn't get it right, and that's not really socialism. And their intentions were far better than than um, market advocates. And I, I think that that mythology has always been part of certainly American academia. Yeah, that's right. So there's a couple of things here that you know we try to kind of highlight in this is is um, you know an important part of the story here, of course, is the open collaboration between Hitler and um, Stalin. And, you know, many people, maybe if they haven't heard about that, are surprised to learn that the two collaborated, um, you know, and were, were allies. But um, if you dig into what they said and what they thought, if you go to the Holocaust website and you peruse the uh, platforms of the Nazi party, you see, you know, this is, the, of course, the, no, the National Socialist Party. You see that there's a half dozen pl um, planks on that platform that live up to the socialist uh half of its name. Um, you know, Hit Hitler, just like Stalin, was interested in socializing major uh, sectors of the economy um, and was interested in socializing economic decisions from interest rates to um, how, you know, department stores were run. So there's a lot more, you know, in, in Congress than I think either Hitler or Stalin really wanted to emphasize. 
Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, the coercion is baked in to the um, socialist approach to the economy. If you want to control um, who buys and who sells and, uh, you know, as as uh, Marx and Engels put it, you know, the socialist idea can be summed up in one sentence, abolition of private property. You want to abolish private property. You're essentially controlling people's lives and you're setting yourself up for conflict, which is one of the reasons, of course, why um, socialist thinkers themselves always emphasize the, the struggle that's built into, uh, you know, what they're trying to achieve is you're you're. Uh, it's a class warfare. It is one class pitted against another. Um, it's people who you're going to encounter people who want to continue to control their own property, their own houses, their own farms. Um, and you're going to have to struggle with them, which is why, um, you know, I don't think it's an accident of history that, you know, the socialist states over and over and over again were um, highly repressive states that not only controlled what people bought and sold, but also what they thought and what they um, what they wrote and what they painted. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, if you, if you read Marx and, and Engels, who were uh, decidedly um, the biggest advocates of of cultural violence um, in the the socialist uh, intellectual tree, but but it was also probably inevitable because you you are forcing people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do, and when they say no, the government steps in. And and forces you to, and and sometimes, sometimes catastrophic ways. The other the other thing that's that's fascinating when you listen to an actual Marxist talk about policy, they are they're collectivist methodologically too, because they they don't really think about people, they don't think about individuals. It's it's all a numbers game, and it's a it's an aggregate. So if in fact they break a few eggs, as supposedly Lenin said. I don't know if he actually said it. Um, it doesn't really matter in their world because they're thinking about the collective. They don't care that they've slaughtered a lot of people along that path to, to utopia. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And y you can see this in decision after de decision that they made. Um, you know, it, it, maybe the first uh, signs of it were during Lenin's time when he's, you know, he set up the, the, for the Europe's first concentration camps and he um, set up the first secret police. Um, but then you see it in Stalin's, um, you know, systematic um, murder of enemies. Uh, you saw it in his um, just absolutely depraved pursuit of collectivization in agriculture, which led to the deaths of, you know, somewhere between five and seven million um, of his own citizens uh, simply because he was so stubbornly attached to the idea that socialism could outproduce um, capitalism. And, uh, you know, he was totally uncowed, was not convinced um, and continued to pursue the policy of collectivization, you know, well after this disaster. And, and of course, so did others, including Mao uh, with his great leap forward. So, so you as an educator, and and certainly everything that that we try to do at Free the People, we struggle with this data point that that we understand the realities of of socialism in practice, and and we understand the economic impossibility of central planning the way that that um, Marx originally envisioned, um, but it doesn't seem to connect with people. And, and the thing I like about your project is there's, there's plenty of economics in there and there's, and there's, there's hardcore um, Austrian analysis of, of the failures of socialism and, and you know, what happens when you don't have prices. But that's not really the basis. And I'll, I'll talk about Estonia, but, but the, other, the other monographs um, as well. Um, you're, you're focused on the entire story and you personalize the story as much as you can, so that that people that are willing to dig a little bit deeper can 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 live this experience. And and you you focus also on on history and culture, and 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 how people um, in these trap trapped in these systems actually were able to get out of them through um, nonviolent action, typically, but but obviously other types as well. Um, I assume that was conscious, like we're. It, this this project comes out of a, um, perhaps a sense of frustration that we're not we're not connecting with people with what we're doing now. 
Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, one of the motivations here is I, I'm the head of the, the Center for Economic Freedom at Fraser, and we produce this annual report on um, economic freedom, which uh, has been wildly successful. The, the lead author, um, unfortunately, just passed away on Jim Gordney. Um, was really a giant in the economics profession, but it's now in the capable hands of uh, his student, Bob Lawson, who's doing an awesome job. But this report, you know, it's it's all numbers, it's data, and it's I find it extremely compelling. You know, there's been over uh, 1,500 peer-reviewed academic studies that use this data um, in regressions to predict outcomes um, that people care about. And we find that, you know, in freer societies, People um, not only have higher per capita income, but they live longer. They have uh, lower infant mortality rates. They have less corruption, um, higher uh, self-reported happiness, all kinds of, you know, things that people care about. Um, but it does kind of, you know, humans, uh, a lot of that data just sort of, um, there's an interesting characteristic of us, you know, it just kind of goes over your head. But if you stop and you tell a story, uh, sometimes that sticks. Um, so that that's exactly what we were trying to do here and telling, you know, some of the stories here in Estonia, because they're um, they're harrowing um, and they're heartbreaking sometimes, but they're also, uh, in many cases, beautiful stories. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, one one story is about this family who um, their father uh, was, was a, um, a husband and wife and they had two two young children. Um, the father was a, a ship captain. His ship was nationalized by the Soviets, um, and they never saw him again. Um, and then it, their house, uh, like so many Estonians, um, their house was invaded by individuals. So you know, it's it's when we think about like you know a whole country, you know, invading another country, you think about it in the aggregate. But what this means is, you know, a Red Army soldier knocks on the door and says, "We're going to be stationed here." And um, so this Red Army soldier occupied their property um, for about uh, a year. Then um, the Germans broke their seat, their their pact with the the um, Soviets and you know invaded Moscow. And and lo and behold, now uh, the Red Army soldier is gone, and you've got a Nazi soldier staying in, in their house. And what does that mean? Well, you know, to practically to have a Nazi soldier you know staying in your house. Well, it means when the soldier takes a um, uh, an unhealthy interest in a young in the young girl who lives there, the poor young you know the, the mother sends the young girl down the street to go go stay at a, a friend's house because the the Nazi soldier is constantly and inappropriately asking her to go hunting with him in the woods. Um, you know that's what it that's what we're talking about we're, when, when we're talking about um, you know oppression. It's it's at the household level. It's at the individual level. Um, and it's also, you know, kind of going back to this point that we were talking about earlier, the, the sort of congru um, continuity between um, Nazi uh, national socialism and, and socialism is, uh, you know, from their perspective, they were both awful. <laughs> you know, the, both occupations were terrible. The Estonians were, um, you know, for a time quite, quite happy to have the Soviets move in because their historical enemies had been the Germans. And in just nine months of, um, you know, Soviet occupation, they were pretty happy to have the Germans come in. And then um, after two years of the German occupation, they they were disabused of any notion that this was going to be better. Um, and it was just, you know, they called it, they, they talked about it as being between two wolves. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what uniform they're wearing. Um, it's still oppression. Free the People is embarking on our most ambitious project to date to document and expose the lies behind the greatest public health failure in my lifetime. We're talking to insiders with firsthand knowledge of the government's role in funding, creating, and then covering up the COVID-19 virus in our exclusive new documentary series, The Cover-Up. But I need your help. We won't get to the bottom of this scandal alone, so I'm asking viewers to crowdsource any information that could be helpful to our investigation. If you're watching this, you already know what the government did during lockdowns was unforgivable. Help us get to the truth and prevent it from ever happening again. To get involved, go to freethepeople.org slash coverup. That's freethepeople.org slash coverup. The truth is out there. You know, one of the things that, that you write about in the book is the, the strong 
sense of uh, cultural, I won't you say national, but cultural identity that Estonians had that made them more difficult to oppress than other Soviet satellites and, and perhaps ultimately led to the, to the ability of the Estonians to break free from, from Soviet control. Talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So that that's a fascinating part about it. So one of the w- ways I like to describe it is the the Estonians are uh, this ancient people in a young country. So um, you know, ethnic Estonians uh, had been uh, trawling the waters off of Estonia and planting the relatively pretty poor um, soil in Estonia for five thousand years. Um, so they've been there a long, long time. But it wasn't until the nineteenth century that they had started to sort of think of themselves as a country. Um, as a as a a nation and a, and sort of a a, a coherent ethnic group, uh, but they do have their own language. They do have their own traditions. Uh, one of these traditions is singing. And so, for as far as anybody can remember, Estonians have been um, you know gathering together around campfires, usually in these big festivals in the summer, and they've been doing these um, these song festivals in singing in sort of call and response fashion, where they sing. Um, you know, the tradition, the, the, the stories of their, of their people, of the origin of the earth. Um, and so that sort of tradition actually never died. Um, and I think part of the reason it didn't die is because of this sort of late awakening in their, um, their, they call it the national awakening in the 19th century, where uh, really cultural entrepreneurs um, rolled up their sleeves and, and started institutions, uh, schools, um, institutions that promote the arts, um, regular song festival, um, groups where they basically just try to, you know, make, make it a habit to, um, you know, think about and recognize the, the Estonian culture. Um, and that really sustained the Estonians in a lot of ways. So the interesting thing happened with the, the song festival. So it, it goes back to the 19th century. They would have this, the, the huge song festival and, um, the, um, the Estonia or the uh, Russians, when they came in, and I do emphasize the Russians. It's not just the Soviet Union. It was really the Russians who saw themselves as the le- as the um, you know first among equals within the Soviet Union. Um, they um, they couldn't suppress the 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 actual festival. They let it keep happening, but they changed it. So instead of singing love songs to the Estonian you know culture. And in the Estonian tongue, they were made to sing um, love songs to Stalin and Lenin, right, in the Russian tongue. Um, and what ended up happening is they sort of, the Estonians sort of very carefully um, just tested how far the the state would let them go. So they would, you know, do their part and sing along with to the um, Soviet songs because, of course, there were Red Army soldiers there that were armed uh, and sort of making them. But then, um, when they had a chance, uh, they would break down to it break. They would break from the scripts and they'd sing spontaneously. They'd sing um, their traditional Estonian songs. And when you've got thirty thousand people singing a song, um, and it's maybe being filmed, it's maybe being um, broadcast. Uh, even as powerful a state as the Soviet Union couldn't stop that. They would try to drown them out. They'd get, they'd, they'd get the army band to try to uh, drown them out, but they, they really couldn't stop it. Um, and so that sort of, you know, kind of trying to push the envelope was really an important ca- characteristic, I think, of the Estonians that sort of helped um, sustain them for a lot of that occupation. There's this book I've been obsessed about for, for decades now called A Force More Powerful, which is a uh a bunch of case studies about nonviolent resistance to various flavors of authoritarian government. And, and uh, I'm thinking of the similar but different um, response to uh, Lech Walesa and the, and the Solidarity Movement. Um, and I assume this is, um, I haven't read the, the, the story about Poland yet, but I assume that's part of it. At some point, like obviously they would have loved to just kill all of the protesters but it had galvanized um, the, the public imagination and it, it creates a, a dilemma for them. And, and, and ultimately, if there's 30,000 people singing Estonian folk songs, um, you got a problem on your hands and, and just slaughtering them probably isn't an option. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so, you know, one of the things that's interesting, especially in light of, you know, going back to the polling that you talked about at the beginning, if you think about 
what is it that makes people so um, young people so passionate about the po- prospects of this uh, socialist utopia? Um, I, I think you know you, you talk to a lot of them, and there's two things that are often you know big motivations. One is uh, the plight of the working man and woman, labor, and the other is the environment. And the interesting thing is, um, in Poland, the revolt against socialism was led by workers. It was a worker revolt, and in Estonia, it began as an environmental protest against, um, you know, yet one more uh, Soviet uh, proposal to uh, rape the Estonian uh, land. So in, um, in Poland, really, it started with um, this, this um, woman who she was c- considered a Stakhanovite uh, worker, which means um, she had been honored by the Soviet state for her hard work ethic. Um, and so she was a, a, essentially this model worker in a shipyard. Um, and she had, but she had this, you know, strong conscious uh, conscience, and she had this sort of sense of social justice. And she had seen um, a communist leader uh, take money. Uh, her, I think it was her supervisor takes take um, money and use it, you know, for his personal um, enrichment, which was uh, unfortunately relatively common in throughout uh, socialist states. And so she did what she thought she should do, and she reported it. And instead of being rewarded, she was fired. And um, you know this set off a wave of protests among her colleagues who just thought this was absolutely ridiculous. Um, and so she and uh, Lech Walesa ended up, um, you know, forming the Solidarity Trade uh, trade Movement. Um, and, you know, they're helped a lot, of course, by um, the, the new Catholic Pope who was uh, selected from Poland, um, who comes and visits the country. Again, the, the Soviets can't really stop that from happening. And he tells the uh, Polish people be not afraid, um, you know, have solidarity. And so they formed this solidarity union um, in part sort of as a response to that. And um, they, you know, f- protest and they, they within a year, one third of the entire Estonia, or I'm sorry, the entire Polish population were members of this trade union. It was the largest uh, non-state trade union throughout the entire uh, socialist world. Um, and they the Soviets do crack down on this. This is um, the long December night of uh, December in December 14th, uh, 1981. They do crack down on it. Um, they arrest thousands of people. You know, one one man was a operator of a uh, a train and he had blown a whistle, I think, for 20 seconds in support of solidarity. And for that 20 second um, blowing of the whistle, he uh, got something like five years in prison and. Um, but when they went to go get Lech Walesa, he said, this is the last nail in the coffin of, of communism. You've lost. Uh, it, it took a, the rest of the 1980s to actually realize that he was right. It might have seemed at the time that, no, um, the Soviet state was as strong as ever. But, you know, that sort of overreaction, uh, especially in an environment when Gorbachev is talking about um, uh, glasnost, openness and perestroika change uh, reform, um, you know, it sort of just showed the, the, the how deceptive the system was and that it wasn't living up to its its uh, promise it you know at the juxtaposition if you're if you're trying to capture the public narrative and i would go all the way back to to john adams who supposedly said at the time of of the american revolution it was one-third tory one-third um, um revolutionaries and one-third they didn't give a damn and i'm paraphrasing um, but I, I suspect that that's almost always true when you're trying to, to galvanize the, the public imagination. And, and to me, this, this isn't probably always true, but it, it strikes me that the most um, compelling transitions from, from the violence of socialism to, to a market-based economy is, is going to be about um, nonviolence, cooperation, um, it's it's going to be values based, and it's going to be something that 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 the people that are in the middle, and you know perhaps being strategically quiet because they don't they don't want to get targeted by by the authoritarians, they become galvanized because of of that 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 more beautiful narrative. Yeah, I think that's right. And so you one of the ways you can see this is some of the incidents that happened during the. Um, the singing revolution, which is when Estonia broke free from the, the Soviet Union. So uh, one of these incidents, so there had been, I mentioned earlier that the the, um, the the Soviet Union is 15 different republics, but the first among equals by far was the Russians. 
uh, the Russian Republic. They they saw themselves as uh, you know they were the first. They knew how socialism worked, and they were going to impose it and improve uh, um, the lives of every other Soviet republic. Um, the so- the Estonian joke, by the way, was you know how many f- five year plans does it take before the um, level of prosperity in Estonia is reduced to that of the the Soviet Union because the the Estonians um, were always a, a little bit richer than the rest of the um, the Soviet Union. So anyway, but one of the strategies there that is that the, the was Russification. So they, you know, tried to crush the the Estonian language. They tried to move Russians into the the uh, Estonian um, Soviet Republic, um, gave them the better jobs. Um, and so this kind of when when we're the uh, Estonians were trying to agitate for their own freedoms, you know, in the late 1980s, you still had a sizable portion of Russians that were living in Estonia that were, you know, pretty. Um, unhappy about any kind of change, right? They benefited from the current system. So this sets up this uh, potential for, you know, a lot of bloodshed. And one of the incidents that happened is um, the the loyalists to the Soviet Union, um, mostly ethnic Russians, surrounded the Estonian parliament. And um, they, you know, were essentially uh, opposed to, to measures that the Estonian parliament was taking, like adopting the trying to adopt the Estonian flag, um, trying to send petitions to the central government saying we, we would like some more autonomy. Um, and so what happened is you've got thousands of, uh, you know, Russian um, communists surrounding the uh, Estonian parliament. And the Estonians got on the radio and they said, um, Estonian people, uh, come help us. Uh, and so the um, the Russians actually had broken into this uh, ancient um, seat of parliament. It's an old castle. Um, this, the scenes are not all that uh, dissimilar from January 6th, it's an, interestingly enough. So they'd broken into the government. And now you have them being surrounded by um, the Estonian people. The Estonian people heard the call and they showed up and they outnumbered them uh, significantly. So now what are we going to do? You've got all these insurrectionists, essentially, the, the, the communists and the Russians inside the parliament, and they're surrounded by thousands of Estonians. Um, what's going to happen? Is this going to lead to bloodshed? Amazingly, it doesn't. Um, the Estonians part ways, and they allow the Russians to exit, and there's not a single drop of blood spilled. Um, so they were very self-conscious about trying to make this as peaceful as possible. And, you know, over and over, there were potentially violent incidents that ended up being resolved without bloodshed. It's really pretty spectacular. And, and just strategically smart because you, you're, you're confronting someone so much more militarily powerful than you are. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And, you know, maybe there's no, I'll give you two other examples of this, um, no more beautiful examples of this than the actual, you know, singing revolution. So there's, this was a, uh, began with a spontaneous um, uh, demonstration in, in June uh, at the Song Festival. Um, ultimately, hundreds of thousands of people showed up. Uh, there was a late, later demonstration um, at, uh, that was more organized in which uh, 300,000 people showed up at the Song Festival grounds. Now think about this, a country of 1 million people. So one in three Estonians are there and they're singing. Um, that's all they're doing is they're singing um, traditional uh, Estonian songs. Um, they're also singing some some songs that demonstrate, you know, their pretty bitter feelings about the uh, the Soviet system and the socialist system, but they're, they're doing it all peacefully. Um, and then the other thing that they did is... Um, they organized what's called the Baltic Way or the Baltic Chain. And so this was in coordination with um, people from Latvia and Lithuania. They formed this 670 kilometer human chain stretching across three countries involving 2 million people. And all they do is they're holding hands. Um, And the important thing is that they're holding hands on August 23rd, which is the anniversary of the infamous Nazi Soviet pact um, in which um, the, uh, um, leaders of the of the two countries essentially agreed to ca- carve up the uh, Europe, with the Soviets getting the eastern half and the Nazis getting the western half. So, um, very strategic, very smart, and and peaceful. Uh, it's really pretty amazing that this happened. At Kibbe on Liberty, freedom is a lifestyle, twenty four seven. Something you live and breathe and wear every day. If that describes you. You need the very best Liberty swag in the market today. 
just like this shirt I happen to be wearing. Go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and check out our exciting merch. You too can love liberty and look cool. Yeah, again, juxtaposition, the the peaceful cooperation, you know, like there's a metaphor here for what we want versus the, the violent oppression of of this the Soviet regime. Um, I want to talk, let's, let's follow that um, because the, the music part of it and, and, and let's say, let's call it pop culture, even though it's, it's steeped in Estonian history. This, this part is fascinating to me because, um, you know, in your book, you, you point out that there's a progressive rock musician who, who sort of uh, jumps on, uh, puts his surfboard on the wave here and, and starts writing um, modern protest songs and you have you have Mart Lahr, who I want to get into as well, who's who's very much into my some of my favorite bands, uh, Led Zeppelin and Queen and things like that. So there's right. there's it it, it invokes um, the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, which was very much triggered by the the oppression and ultimate jailing of of a progressive uh, underground band called Plastic People of the Universe and. And, and Vaclav Havel was was animated by their jailing, and that led to that revolution. This this is quite similar because you you have the same dynamics where where free um, artistic expression is is a vivid um, um, reminder of what they aren't allowed to do in Estonia. Yeah, that's right. Um, so you know, some of the story does start with um, you know Gorbachev. And uh, what he allowed and what he didn't allow. So remember, you know, Gorbachev comes to power and he, he does, he's the first, you know, post um, revolution uh, Soviet leaders. And so as a result of that, I do think he kind of understood and he, he's quoted as saying this quite a few times that, that he knew something had to change. Um, and so his two proposals are perestroika and glasnost. And perestroika means reform. As it turns out, he was just absolutely unwilling to actually entertain serious reforms. Uh, he was not interested in entertaining, you know, a, a, a break from socialism. And he, you know, at one point he summons uh, Estonian leaders to Moscow and he says, um, it, it's, it's on video, you can see him uh, saying, uh, you know, understand, uh, don't make too much of a fuss. Um, those are literally his words. <laughs> and he says, uh, any solutions you find have to be within the socialist system. So he was really not open to, to much reform, but his other aspect uh, of uh, change he called glasnost, which was openness. Uh, and in the world of international uh, CNN, right, and you know international um, news networks and TV cameras, uh, this party actually did sort of follow through on. And so this is in part, I think, where this uh, nonviolent um, civil protest ends up being important. So it's in that environment in which you get this very curious, interesting mix of, again, think back an ancient people in a new country, a young country, you've, they're singing sometimes, you know, 3000 year old songs, and then they're singing brand new songs. Um, and then if you look at the videos, you know, it's got these, uh, you know, beautiful, you know, young, young kids with uh, pigtails uh, in this traditional Estonian dress uh, singing these songs. And you think, oh, they must be singing, you know, beautiful love songs. And some of them are love songs to Estonia, but some of them have a bitter, you know, uh, some of the newer ones especially have this sort of bitter um, taste to them. So here's one of them. Uh, if, if you, uh, if you descend in lies upside down in dreams onto all fours under the command onto the belly, under the ruble, then you're, you get fleas to the groin, mange in the heart, tapeworms in the head, bones in the belly. Then you go to hell. So, you know, you've got these beautiful, happy people singing some uh, pretty angry songs. Uh, and that was kind of what was the environment at the time. Uh, very, very interesting. And then a lot of it is led by young people. So you mentioned Mart Lahr and, you know, his, his he's uh, a Guns N' Roses and Queen and Phil Collins fan. Um, he was only 32 uh, when he becomes the, the first democratically elected leader um, in Estonia. And he's got several other members of his parliament that are all in their 20s and 30s. Um, so it was a very uh, youthful sort of revolt. Yeah, kind of a, a punk, punk rock aesthetic, mm -hmm. which at its best is, is anti-authoritarian, right. um, 
we won't we won't talk about Rage Against the Machine because <laughs> yeah. I, I can't explain that one. But uh, so I want to talk about history because we're, this this gets into uh, Mart Lars' version of the story because he he is essential in the transformation of Estonia into into a prosperous nation. Um, but he gets involved in and I guess um, you'll correct me because he's he's holding these these public. Uh, conversations about Estonian history and he is a he's a history professor is it is it college or high school I don't know what his deal is at the time so he doesn't get his PhD until after he's actually prime minister so I think he may have only been a high school uh, history teacher at the time um, but I could be wrong on that it's possible he was teaching at the college level without but a it's history. it's it's profound that a a let's say a high school history professor teacher, is is uh, basically leading a revolution, leading by not leading, as, as as I love to say. But but this idea, you know, we started this conversation pointing out that uh, uh, too many young people, not just in America, you pull other countries as well, they don't know the history of these these ideas that have absolutely been tried and absolutely been catastrophic failures in in the context of of human dignity, um, and this was a key part. Of of Estonian Estonia's uh, movement towards freedom is just reminding people of their own history and 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 a key part of the Soviet model was to erase history. Um, yeah, that's right. There's a that's metaphor right. in here somewhere too. Yeah, that's right. So again, go back to this date, this August 23rd. Uh, so let me just paint the picture for you. It's August 23rd, 1939. Um, um, Herr von Ribbentrop, who's the na- uh, Nazi foreign minister, he lands in Moscow. He's greeted by six giant swastika flags that are flying proudly uh, for him. These flags had only weeks earlier been um, used in uh, Nazi propaganda, or sorry, Soviet propaganda against Nazis. Um, now the um, the Soviets take them out of the propaganda studio and proudly wave them. Um, he's whisked off to, to the Kremlin where he gets to meet with Stalin himself. They sign the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Um, Molotov, by the way, is the Soviet foreign minister. He'd only been on the job for about nine months. And the reason is that he, uh, his predecessor was Jewish and Stalin had um, fired him as a, a conciliatory gesture to uh, Hitler. Uh, ironically, uh, Molotov's wife was Jewish. Um, she ultimately, you know, Stalin himself was um, quite anti-Semitic. Um, and Stalin ended up arresting Molotov's wife, um, and ultimately Molotov lost his job uh, because of his wife's uh, um, Jewish ancestry. In any case, uh, they formed this pact. Publicly, the main point of the pact is um, non-aggression, but there are secret protocols to the pact, uh, secret protocols that are, one, the worst kept secrets of the Cold War because um, uh, people in the Baltic states knew about them within weeks. And two, they are denied. Their very existence is denied for a half century, well into the Gorbachev era. Gorbachev was denying them and saying, you know, this is not, um, uh, this is just uh, propaganda from the West. There was there's no such thing as, as protocols. The, the Estonian uh, people joined our, the Soviet Union of their own free will, um, which was just not true. Um, and so these protocols called for a, um, you know, the invasion of carving, as I mentioned earlier, carving up Europe. Um, and you know, at the end, Stalin, who was kind of a teetotaler actually, um, toasts to Hitler's health. Um, and so one of the things that the early protesters in Estonia now, now let's, let's jump forward four decades. Um, actually before I jump forward, let me just quickly say how, how they ended up being, you know, subsumed to the Soviet Union is, um, the Soviets invade Poland from the East and the Germans from the West. Um, they take it over with by the end of September 1939, it's um, they, it's jointly occupied. They have this uh, joint Nazi-Soviet uh, parade in Brest the Tovst. Um, and then the Soviets move 160,000 troops to the border of Estonia. On the other side, there's only 16,000 Estonian troops. Um, they demand that Estonia sign uh, a non-aggression pact with them. Estonians feel it, and they have no choice, so they do so. And then within months, they say that their their Baltic friends in, in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are um, plotting against them. And so they demand to hold elections. They're fraudulent elections. Um, 
There's one instance where the turnout was 122%. Um, there's another where we, the re results of the election were announced accidentally uh, before the election had even taken place. Um, and then with Red Army soldiers in uh, parliament, that are, these are armed soldiers, uh, the new newly elected parliament in Estonia petitions the Soviet Union for entrance. So, you know, they, they ask to be to be led into the Soviet Union. So that's the circumstances of their how they got in there. And what's important now, now jump forward, you know, five decades later, we're talking in the late 80s um, and the uh, Estonians hit on this strategy of emphasizing the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, not just as a way to sort of embarrass the um, Soviets, which I think probably it, it was an embarrassment, certainly, but also to highlight that the way that the Soviet, that the Estonia had been dragooned into the Soviet Union was entirely illegal. Um, and if it was illegally annexed, then they argued Estonia isn't even a part of the Soviet Union. It's a, they had been living through five decades of a lie. And so by emphasizing that, um, that was a, you know, an important legal strategy and ultimately, uh, helped them gain their independence. But it does mean that they sort of, um, you know, to, to use Orwell's, uh, line from, uh, 1984, he who controls the past controls the present and he who controls the present controls the future. Well, the Estonians managed to take control of their past. By just speaking the truth about how they had been forced into the Soviet Union, and by taking control of that, they managed to write their their destiny and, and uh, you know have a future for themselves independent of the Soviet Union. Thank you for joining me today on Kibbe on Liberty, and for being part of our fiercely independent audience. Every week, my organization, Free the People, partners with Blaze TV to bring you this show. My guests bring smart perspectives on everything from current events to timeless philosophical debates. If you like what you hear, go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and support Kibbe on Liberty so we can continue to produce these honest conversations with interesting people. Now, let's get back to it. And and this is when Mart Lahr becomes a um, sort of leader in the revolution, just, just reminding people of, of this history. Um, how does he become uh, such a popular figure that, that he is... Um, um, not not immediately, but soon after the fall of the Soviet control, becomes the the first prime minister at thirty two or something young yeah. like that. So you know, and one thing I want to emphasize is you know there's a lot of different factions here. There's more radical factions, and then there's more moderate. Um, and uh, he was probably a little bit more radical, but there were people that were more radical than he was. Um, and so you know, essentially, he's out there he forms the Estonian heritage society that talk their, their whole mission is to talk openly about the past, um, especially the, the Molotov Ribbentrop pact. Um, but, but well, the other past, the, the, you know, the 19 years that Estonia had spent as an independent country, for example. Um, so he sort of like the American revolution, you know, you, you've got different factions with, you know, you think about Adams and, and um, Hamilton and Jefferson and Washington, all these folks, uh, sort of disagreed and could be put on a different different spectrums, and um, ultimately came together. And you know, the, the, the architects of the Re of the American Revolution ended up being the first politicians to um, hold office, and that was the case with uh, with Lar, as well as many of the other leaders. Um, you know, during that time, and when he came to office, he's he's essentially. I think you've met him. I have not. Um, he's you know he's a he's an unassuming man, right? He's kind of, a, um, you know, got, got this sort of, um, quirky way about him. And one of the things he says, I think he's repeated this story many times is that, you know, as a kid, um, he didn't know anything about economics. Um, but he had heard about this just evil Western economist, Milton Friedman, that the, uh, the Soviets said was just this, uh, you know, evil person. And he thought, well, gee, if this, if this is what the Soviets think is a bad, uh, economist, I better read him because he might be good. Um, and so he, you know, he picked up, um, freedom and prosperity and free to choose and he read them and, um, you know, in his telling, uh, he just sort of thought this was normal economics. He just assumed, well, all of this stuff had been done in the, in, um, the United States, right. That, uh, they, they'd already implemented this stuff. So let's just do it. Uh, he kind of didn't, um, appreciate in my view, I, how, um, radical he was being 
Uh, he, and what he ended up, you know, proposing and, and presiding over is uh, the world's first flat personal income tax rate. It also applies to corporate income. It's actually only a distributed profits tax. So not a dollar is taxed until it's actually distributed to owners or shareholders. Um, he proposed and and managed to get uh, balanced budgets. Uh, Estonia is unique among all the uh, former socialist countries as consistently balancing its budgets. Um, they uh, got a pretty uh, radical form of monetary reform. This actually preceded him, but he supported it, um, where they tied their currency to the uh, a new currency to the Deutsche Mark, um, and it was enforced uh, through a currency board. Um, they unilaterally uh, emphasize this unilaterally uh, eliminated all tariffs and all barriers to foreign uh, trade. Um, this was, you know, an important, uh, essentially down payment on further reform, because if you are allowing your companies to now be in competition with any other company worldwide, you better make sure that other governance systems are, are running well, that the, that, uh, you've got a, a good rule of law property is, is well protected. You've got, uh, decent regulatory systems. You're not oppressing companies through regulations or taxes. Uh, so it was a very important down payment. Um, pro- privatization, you know, they, they, as best as they could, their first, uh, approach to privatization was, look, if you can find any proof that you owned this property before the, the, uh, Soviets came in and nationalized it, congratulations, it's yours. So, you know, we tell the story of, uh, a, a widow who went into her backyard and dug up a tin and opened it up and found a piece of paper that that she had buried there five decades earlier with her husband showing that she and her husband had owned this block of stores. She took it down to the local authorities and said, look, this is the proof that I used to own this. And the authorities said, yep, it sure is. Congratulations, you own it again. So that's sort of almost, it's simple. It's its really, um, you know, it's not all that complicated, but it was bold in the sense that he was just willing to, ju- to um, he knew what needed to be done. A lot of people did at the time, but he insisted that it just be done quickly don't stand there quivering. Uh, he adopted the phrase, just do it. You know, the appropriate, appropriately capitalistic phrase, just do it, uh, because he knew it was going to be difficult and, and um, it was the right thing to do. And it, was, it wasn't going to be made any easier by soft pedaling it and dragging it out. Yeah, I, I got to hang out with him. And your description is, is, is accurate. He's, he's chill. He's friendly. Um, he's, he's unassuming. And this, this is after he has succeeded in this in this dramatic transformation that that is sustainable um, to this day and and he jokes about it but I suspect the joke is real like like when he was reading Friedman he just thought that that was sort of normal Western American policy and that we had done all these things and and at some point after he did it he discovered that we hadn't done any of that stuff we didn't do school choice. We, we hadn't stabilized our currency. We hadn't uh, balanced our budget. And, and we, we weren't so great at privatization either. Um, it, by the way, it's, it's, it's noticeable. We're watching, and I want to get into transition because I think this is, again, a very important strategic question. Like We, we understand economically what works, um, but that doesn't tell us how we get from where we are to where we need to be in a lot of countries. I'll, I'll include my own in this, but... Uh, I'm, of course, thinking of Argentina, which has been a quasi-socialist basket case with hyperinflation for for most of my adult life. And we have another guy who's one of his dogs is named Milton after Milton Friedman. And I'm guessing he's read exactly the same books that Mart Lahr read. And and you could look at the policies that Javier Mille has has rolled out as as the new, I don't know if he's a president or prime minister. I should know this, but uh, yeah, sure. I think he's a president. Let's say that. Um, so and and the president of Argentina has um, because the socialists always controlled everything. They gave the president a lot of power, so he's he's been unilaterally implementing almost exactly the same agenda that you just described happened in Estonia. And and I want to find this out, but I got to believe that he's looked at Estonia, and he's looked mm-hmm. at transition. And um, is has opinions about how quickly can you go from an economic basket case, a socialist experiment where where people are literally starving and, and hyperinflation, 
and just everything is broken and and it it is people are desperate and people are desperate enough to try these radical reforms that that Mart Lar is proposing um, you talk about this a lot in the book and I think it's an important conversation to have like the 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 relative virtue of of a slow transition versus just just doing it and obviously Mart Lar just did it and you got to assume that um, as dangerous as that was for him at the time, um, Estonia would not have succeeded if he hadn't done it that way. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, one thing to keep in mind here is, you know, the parameters of the debate. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, okay, there's there's two questions here. What do you do? And we can call that the, what at the time they called it the Washington Consensus, which was, you know, basically, you know, privatize, generally reduce taxes, um, try to make uh, taxes the tax base as broad as possible, try to make spending as broad as possible, you know, and don't favor particular firms or industries or groups, but just, you know, provide public goods, generally open for free trade, uh, generally get your monetary policy under control. Um, and this sort of consensus, there's a reason why they called it a consensus, because people from the left uh, to the right generally basically embraced that. That wasn't all that controversial at the time. Um, I think people have sort of retroactively made it seem like it was controversial, but it really wasn't. Um, what was what was an open question at the time was how quickly do you do this? And there were reformers who said you got to go slow um, because if you if it, you might need to adjust as you go uh, because you might get it wrong um, and you might need all the pieces in place in order for it to work. Um, and I you know I think if you're in 1991 and you know, you you want to reform? I certainly am not going to blame you if you think that that seems reasonable. That seemed that I could see a reasonable person thinking that. On the other hand, there were uh, others, you know, Jeff Sachs and and um, others who observed the same situation and said, "Look, you just got to go fast. Um, one, you're going to it's going to be painful, um, and you know, there's as um, our, our friend Pete uh, Becky, you know, puts it in one of his books. You know, a lot of what happens in a socialist economy is most people wake up and they go to the wrong job in the wrong uh, industry in the wrong location. <laughs> and so that's what your training is. And you're suddenly exposed to free market forces where consumers are making choices rather than central, you know, planners, then you may end up, you know, that's going to be a, a potentially painful transition. There's no question about that. Um, and so what people said is what the, the people who were in favor of a quicker reform said, look, it's going to be painful, but you are going to lose whatever political capital you have if you prolong that pain. So just, you know, bite the bullet and just get it done with. And by the way, it's interesting to read, you know, um, accounts of Paul Volcker, for example, if you read uh, Jennifer Rubin's new um, biography of Milton Friedman and what he was dealing with and trying to break the back of 14... Uh, years of, of inflation in the United States. It's not all that dissimilar to what, you know, we encounter when we try to reform things uh, in the West as well. Um, and so Jeff Sachs uh, has this great metaphor. He says, you know, trying to do the gradual reform is like Great Britain deciding that it, it's going to switch the side that they drive on from the uh, left to the right, but it's, it's going to do it first with trucks and then later with cars. Uh, and his point is like, look, it's going to just sow chaos. So anyway, um, I, I can see how somebody in 1991 might say, you know, gee, I don't know whether fast or, or, or slow is, is the best approach. Now, with the hindsight of 30 years, we can see uh, pretty clearly, and some of it comes from um, studies that use the Economic Freedom of the World Index, uh, we can see that the, the fast movers like Estonia, um, they outperformed the slow pokes. Um, it's but time and time again, this has been shown. So there's a, a good study by um, Robin and Kevin Greer, a uh, husband and wife team that does that looks at this. There's another study by um, Bob and uh, Carrie Lawson, a, a father-son uh, team that have looked at the data as well. Um, it's very, very consistent. The story that we tell in terms of Estonia of uh, being a fast reformer that some, that moved quickly and managed to avoid a lot of the problems of the others, you know, that's actually a pretty consistent story. So, you know, and the data, you know, demonstrate they, they they really tell the story so the estonians are now twice as wealthy as uh uh you know average member of the former soviet union they're basically um they and and the uh 
Latvians and the Lithuanians are right up there as the in in the top and as, as fast performers and some of the free uh, and some of the wealthiest people in the former Soviet Union. They have the lowest um, poverty rate of any uh, um, former Soviet state. It's one tenth the average of the poverty uh, of the poverty rate in the general uh, Soviet um, former Soviet states. They have more startups than any other uh, uh, country in Europe. They have more unicorns. Uh, which are startups valued at over a billion dollars than any other country in Europe. They have uh, corruption levels that are actually uh, better than in the United States. They're comparable to Canada, and they're the lowest of inter- any former Soviet state. Um, their infant mortality rate, was, which was once uh, you know, several times higher than neighboring Finland, is now uh, less than that in Finland. Um, they've closed the gap in terms of uh, their uh, life expectancy with the rest of the world. So just you know, marker after marker after marker, happiness, uh, you know, ha- um, public perceptions of the government, they, it's, it's been a, just a remarkable success. So go big or go home. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So I, I think that this, and this is why I like this project, because there's, there's practical lessons here for a recovering economist like me who's trying to com- communicate the power of, of these ideas and, and the beautiful things that happen when people are free to coll- co- corroborate and collaborate and, and build and succeed and fail on their own accord. Um, so I, I think, uh, I, I think we can wrap it up there, but I'm, I want to, I want to wrap up because I always have to quote Hayek in my shows, but I'm, I'm thinking of this, uh, this great essay that is so, um, so modern, even though it was written, um, a generation ago, the intellectuals and socialism, and I'm sure you've read this essay. And and he, he's he's and and you gotta you gotta appreciate where Hayek's coming from because he's literally surrounded by authoritarians um, closing in on him. Um, he, maybe he's hiding at the peak of Mont Pelerin at the time he's writing this essay. But the intellectuals and socialism, um, he openly asks, like, why why am I not? able to persuade my colleagues why are we losing the intellectual battle um why and you know it's it's not intellectuals just as university guys he has a much broader definition of what an intellectual is it's a a a public person that expresses opinions i guess i guess i would fit his category and and he doesn't necessarily mean it as a compliment but uh he he talks towards the end you know we 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 market advocates classical liberals spent all of our time trying to repair the damage of big government at the margins. And we're constantly trying to, to tweak things and make things better. Um, whereas our adversaries are out there offering this, this big, beautiful, utopian vision of the future. And, and I, think, I think what your, your book does, particularly about Estonia, is it, it, it taps into some of these, these beautiful things that I think will resonate more with people than just, l- let me show you the data. All due respect to Bob Lawson, um, yeah. it's, it's, not a, it's not really a fight about data. And it's great that we have the data on our side and it's great that the, the facts and the economics are on our side, but you know, can, we, can, can we tell a, a compelling story about how we get out of uh, the mess we're in? Like it's happening in Argentina. It should be happening in the United States. Uh, we're, we're accruing, I think it's, a trillion dollars in debt every six months is what I just saw, and that's that's insane, and mm-hmm. and that's unsustainable. But uh, we we have very few Mart Lars in our country that are like you know we should be radical, we th- we should we should just do it. We should be big, um, and I'm hoping that uh, that Mile succeeds because then we can point to something that's not just about economic transition. It's it's engaging in the cultural debate and and turning on young people to something more beautiful than the status quo. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think part of this is emphasizing just the full breadth of human freedom, right? You know, uh, the freedom to buy and sell is important because uh, if you're not able to buy and sell, you're you're restricting a a human desire and a human freedom that people, a human interest that people have um, and and you're limiting their possibilities. But it also means that you're limiting their ability to express themselves, you know, um, to uh, exchange with one another as as equals, um, and that's you know, deeply ingrained in our human 
you know, desire to connect with people, you know, think about just, you know, the term of the, the idea of where the word Cadillacy comes from, you know, it's um, the process by which strangers become friends through exchange. Um, so I do think we, we kind of need to emphasize that whole, um, you know, w- width and breadth of the human condition and, and human freedom. And that's one of the things that's so inspiring is not only is Estonia, of course, one of the most economically free put, uh, places in the world, but it's also uh, one of the most, you know, socially free as well. Um, the two go hand in hand. So uh, where can people find you, the Fraser Institute and and these monographs? Awesome. Uh, yeah. So the, the project is uh, Realities of Socialism. If you just type in Realities of Socialism, it'll come straight to the uh, Fraser Institute's website. Uh, you can read about, uh, you know, Estonia, you can read about Poland. Uh, we've got several other books in the, in the, uh, the series as well. We've, there's infographics and, and videos and um, podcasts like this one uh, that you can share and like and uh, distribute to all, all your friends. And uh, since we're picking on Bob Lawson, uh, tell people about that. He's been on the show and he's talked about it. But this this is an essential resource to know where your country is succeeding or failing relative to other countries. Absolutely. So this is this project. Uh, go to freetheworld.com uh, and you can see objective m- measures of 165 jurisdictions around the world with uh, 45 different indicators um, assessing as objectively as possible uh, what degree of freedom do governments permit uh, people to have in order to engage in economic activity? How free are people to buy and sell and um, exchange and own property and run businesses? Um, uh, and uh, it's inspired this huge literature uh, assessing the effect of economic freedom on human well-being. It's really uh, an inspiring testament to the idea that you can actually answer the world's questions by looking at data. And lo and behold, you find the freedom works. And I, I should uh, just remind uh, American viewers watching this and listening to this that America is is sliding in, in their standing in the world. And and this is unacceptable to those of us that believe in freedom and, and actually believe in the American idea. So um, that's a that's sort of a sad way to end this, but this has been an awesome conversation and uh, I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.